Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. I found myself intrigued the other day when Professor Stick, who is totally awesome and you should totally go check him out, did a response video to a channel called A Bit of Orange. I started watching through their videos and I must agree with the good professor that their format is entertaining and enjoyable, if only their content were up to scratch. So they have this playlist called Evolution 101, which is them reading through a page put out by UC Berkeley on evolution. It's an excellent website, which our bit of orange tries to nitpick through. Let's take a look. Just remember, the stuff presented by this creepy bear is from the Evolution 101 website, written by the Understanding Evolution Team. Commentary by Rentafriend2000, that's me. They begin with a simple definition. The definition. Biological evolution, simply put, is descent with modification. Definition fail! Really? I mean, it's a touch oversimplified, but it seems pretty good to me. I implore you, O oh Orange One, to elaborate on why it failed. This is put a little too simply. Yeah, but as it is a website directed at helping people with little to no knowledge of anything about evolution, oversimplification is understandable. I mean, your average layman probably wouldn't immediately understand the definition changes in allele frequency within populations without any more in-depth explanation. I mean, I barely remember what alleles are, and I regularly make videos about a very relevant subject, namely evolution. Now imagine someone who doesn't do anything in their everyday life that has anything to do with biology 15 to 20 years after after any high school biology class. Tell them that definition and see if they understand it on the first go. Or see if maybe you'll have to explain what alleles are, and that implied in the definition is that changes take place over successive generations. Everything that lives is descended from something of its own kind. Species, not kind. Kind is too vague, it doesn't mean anything, and can change meanings depending on what is convenient at the time. So let's go with species. Everything alive is descended from something of the same species. And most are not clones of their parents, save a few bacteria and other wee terrible basties. Agreed. Most species do reproduce in a way that results in offspring that are genetically different from their parents. This is helpful as genetic diversity can assist with survival in changing conditions, and I don't think that even a young Earth creationist would suggest that the conditions on the planet Earth don't change. This weak sauce definition means that you, being descended from your parents but being not their clone, are an example of evolution. Yes, I'm so glad you understand. That is exactly it. We are all slightly different from our parents, and selection pressures decide which differences are favored over the long haul. So the difference between myself and my parents might be slight, but it is an example of evolutionary change. This definition could be restated. Biological evolution is any living thing giving rise to another living thing which is not its identical clone. Yeah, it could, but I mean, the original sounds better, and even the organisms that clone themselves are subject to mutations, which aids in their evolution, so your definition doesn't encompass what evolution actually is quite as well as the original. Kind of narrows the possibilities a smidge too much, if you ask me. Also, I refuse to say I evolved from my mother. That, that sounds weird. Agreed, but my mother is way too weird for me to not want to be genetically different from her, so having evolved from her is preferable. Furthermore, they don't say what kind of modification. I think we'd all agree that a normal four-legged dog giving birth to a one-legged puppy named Lil Brother would be descent with modification, but hardly a big evolutionary leap forward. You're right, we wouldn't really count it as an evolutionary step forward. But yes, it would count as evolution. You are making the mistake of applying intentions to the process of evolution. Evolution itself doesn't care about anything. All evolution is, is descent with modification. Things change over generations. That's it. Which changes are successful is determined by natural selection, so Lil Brother there would probably not survive long in the wild, so would not produce offspring, so that evolutionary path would be a dead end, meaning that dogs with four legs have a survival advantage over dogs with one leg. It doesn't mean that the dog with one leg didn't evolve the characteristic of only having one leg, just that it was not evolutionarily successful. Keep in mind that we need to define the process so that bacteria can change over time into wolves and cabbages and everything in between. Little brother just ain't getting the job done. There are plenty of species who didn't get the job done, so to speak. Do you know what happened to them? They went extinct. They were not favored by the selection pressures, so the creatures who evolved differently than them had the survival advantage. This definition encompasses small-scale evolution, 
changes in gene frequency in a population from one generation to the next, and large-scale evolution, the descent of different species from a common ancestor over many generations. Evolution helps us to understand the history of life. Once again, since they don't define change, how's that for a popular bait-and-switch America? Then it can mean any change at all. Yeah. Any change between generations is a form of evolution. Any at all. And then natural selection decides which of these are successful. Let's see. Uh, encompasses changes in a population, or changes between kinds. So, evolution is anything that ever happens to living things. Well, not just anything. I mean, any genetic changes that happen to living things that span multiple generations. I mean, you keep saying this as if small changes don't count for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, this puts the term on par with other excellent pieces of scientific terminology, such as stuff, junk, things, and sorta. Also, kinds. You forgot the creationist vague favorite in that list. Good job, team. Let's stick those words in the glossary in the back of the book, and then we'll all break for a biscotti. Just biscotti? I mean, wouldn't you usually have biscotti with coffee of some sort? Or has my time in restaurants just warped my understanding of how snack foods work? Why does a team of PhDs come up with such a weak definition? It's not that it's a weak definition, it's that it's a general definition. It's a definition that, in order to properly define the word, must encompass a very broad topic. That's like complaining that the definition of the word world is weak for including all countries, people, and natural features, because Niagara Falls has different characteristics from the Sahara Desert. For three reasons. One, because when you define evolution too clearly, you start to see a whole whack of examples of things not evolving. And something not evolving is a problem because... reasons? There are plenty of creatures out there which haven't evolved much over long periods of time. I'm sure you're about to point that out, but before you do, I just want to mention that even should these creatures be genetically identical to their ancestors from millions of years ago, which they're not, even the extremely slow-changing examples of shark and coelacanth have evolved when compared to their fossils, there is no rule in evolution stating that all creatures must evolve, so this point is moot. Like living fossils, or doing the opposite of what evolution needs to do, such as genetic entropy, extinctions, vestigial organs, etc, etc, etc. Again, you're assuming that there is an intention behind evolution. There just isn't. Extinction and vestigial features are both things that you would expect to see if evolution is true. If legs no longer serve the whale, but there aren't great selection pressures to eliminate all signs of legs ever having existed, you would expect the remaining vestiges of the legs that they once had to stick around for quite a long time, and possibly even be used for a new purpose. And that's exactly what we see. Species go extinct if their evolution can't keep up with a changing environment, whether those changes come from a new predator, or climate change, or an asteroid impact, or what have you. As far as genetic entropy is concerned, the only places I could find any information about that were creationist websites and geneticentropy.org, which is where the guy who came up with the idea is trying to sell his book on it. I'll give you credit, though. John Sanford, the author of the book, is actually a geneticist. He just hasn't managed to publish anything about genetic entropy in any peer-reviewed journals. So either he hasn't submitted his papers for peer review, which seems odd if he's genuine, or his ideas don't hold up to the scrutiny of other geneticists. But yeah, I get it, there's this vast global conspiracy of scientists who suppress any findings that could support creationism, so it makes perfect sense that he can't get his papers published. 2. The evidence only supports the first category they provide, small-scale changes within existing kinds. What's the difference, I wonder, between small-scale and large-scale changes? Could it be that small-scale changes happen over small-scale time, and large-scale changes happen over large-scale time? Nah, that seems too easy to be true. It must be that large-scale changes just don't happen at all, and large-scale time just doesn't even exist. If the definition was clear enough to differentiate between what they call microevolution and macroevolution, you would quickly see there's no evidence for macro. Macro is just a lot of micros. I mean, I can see on my tape measure where one centimeter adds up to another one to become two centimeters, and then they become three, eventually getting to ten, then all the way up to a whole meter. I can even see about 5 kilometers into the distance in the right conditions. But of course, these relatively small changes in distance don't prove that something can exist thousands of kilometers away from me, right? I have a bucket of water that has been colored blue with food coloring. As I add individual drops of red food coloring to the bucket, I can watch the water gradually change color. After enough time and enough drops have been added, the water will be purple. Which drop changed it from blue to purple, I wonder? After every individual drop went into the bucket, the water was still the same color as it was before that drop went in, just a slightly different shade. 
So when did it transition from blue to purple? I didn't see the exact transition, therefore adding red to blue water does not make purple. Just because we can't see the exact point where one species becomes another one doesn't mean it didn't happen, just that it happens so gradually as to be pretty much undetectable, even if you watch the whole process. There was no one point in the where the blue water suddenly stopped being blue and became purple, but it is undeniable that it happens. Which is the place where creationism and evolution actually differ. We don't balk at natural selection or Mendelian genetics. We invented those. So if you don't balk at natural selection, then why do you have such a problem with species going extinct? Or the mutation causing a dog to have only one leg not being successful? We just refuse to call them evolution when they fit so well into the biblical creation account. And there's the crux of the matter. I don't care whether or not it fits into the biblical creation account. There are plenty of people out there who have made evolution fit into their biblical creation account. It's when you start ignoring and warping science to fit into the Bible that I have a problem. If you wanted to reinterpret the Bible to make it work with how we know things work today, then that's your prerogative. But if you insist on not only ignoring and warping how we know things work, but insisting that other people not only accept but also teach your warped view of how things work, then I have an issue. Because with this definition, when creationists say they don't believe in evolution, you can mock them for believing that living things never change when it's obvious they do. <laughs> Evil win! Meh. Creationists usually make enough of a fool of themselves that I don't feel the need to do any additional mocking. Especially not against straw men like that. I mean, it's pretty obvious that everyone would agree that they are different from their parents. So making fun of someone for not believing that is just unnecessary unless they specifically said that they don't believe it. Tell you what, you find someone that says that living things never change, and then we can join forces and mock them together. Also, helps us to understand the history of life seems to be their way of saying, is the religious dogma with which we will interpret the data, if we bother with any. Projection much? It's literally just saying that an understanding of evolution helps with understanding how life went from point A to point B. I get that in order to understand the history of life from a biblically literal point of view, you do need to interpret everything through religious dogma and ignore huge swaths of data, but that doesn't mean that everyone else does the same thing. I mean, you saying that about evolution is a bit of an admission that using religion as a lens with which to view the world is not a good thing, is it not? You'll know that the way they wrote it, evolution is not built on their understanding of the history of life, but rather is the lenses through which they will look at the past. It was looking at the past and seeing how creatures change over time that led to the development of the theory of evolution, not the other way around. Darwin was not sitting on the HMS Beagle trying to figure out how to thwart religion once and for all. He was simply making observations and connecting the dots. Now, these dots have remained connected over the years, and several of the predictions made as a result of the theory of evolution have been demonstrated. I will leave a link to a list of successful predictions uh, in the description, but some notable ones were the prediction that the precursors to trilobites would be found in pre-Silurian rocks, which they were, the prediction that a transitional whale which had both teeth and baleen would be found, it was, and the prediction that humans would still have the gene to make vitamin C since we are descended from ancestors that were able to make vitamin C. We do, it's just switched off. Do you see the difference? Uh -huh. It's not a conclusion, it's a dogma. But is it, though? I don't believe in evolution because it's what I want to believe in. I accepted evolution because the evidence just kept piling up. Is it a dogma if I resisted it with all my mental capacity for as long as I could in order to hold on to my religion? Now let's look at the definition of dogma, shall we? It is a principle or set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. I have never heard any scientist claim that evolution is incontrovertibly true. It has always been more along the lines of, this is why it is true, and, and you can demonstrate it to be true. And if you can demonstrate it to be false, then you'll probably win a Nobel Prize for making a scientific discovery so large and important as to overturn conclusions drawn for over a century and supported by all the evidence. That doesn't sound very dogmatic. Now, the people who have gone on record as saying that they would believe the Bible even if it said something demonstrably false and would do their best to figure out why this demonstrably false thing is actually true. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said 2 plus 2 equals 5, I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it, accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. That sounds dogmatic. So, once again, their definition above just isn't cutting it. It's like I need a Darwin English dictionary up in here. What evolution must mean in order to be a useful term is a definition like this. 
an unguided natural process by which genetic information increases, resulting in additions and beneficial modifications to phenotype and or behavior, that helps the individual to survive, reproduce, and pass on that genetic information. Wow, just, wow, that's so very, very off. Again, you're putting a mind behind evolution. I can kind of understand why, as you do believe that everything in the universe does have a mind behind it. But evolution has no goal. It doesn't care whether the changes help or hurt the creature that has changed. Just the fact that they change is evolution. Now, the creatures that are favored by natural selection fit this definition, but 99% of creatures to ever have existed were not ultimately favored by natural selection. That doesn't mean that evolution didn't happen, it just means that our history is filled with evolutionary failures. And again, when I say failure, that is me talking with a mind, a mind which has defined success in this instance as the preservation of the species. Now, preservation is, by definition, not change, so it might almost be said that for a species to truly be preserved, evolution must be halted, and therefore evolution requires the ultimate failure of most species. Just because something doesn't look good to us doesn't mean it didn't happen. This is evolution the process. Evolution the worldview is this. All living things are the result of the evolutionary process, going back in time through common ancestors, until arriving at a first universal ancestor, a single cell, which itself was the result of matter plus time plus chance, meaning that all life is merely a chemical process beginning with rain falling on rocks. Well, that's not so much a worldview as an overly simplistic version of how we got the diversity of life we see today from the last universal common ancestor. Also, several billion evolution-accepting Christians would probably take issue with your wording there, which was designed to make it seem like you can't accept evolution while believing a religion, which is just simply not true. There are many different worldviews that all accept evolution, and most of them are religious to some degree. Oh, look at this. We're in the first section, and I'm already doing these people's job for them. Well, you did an abysmal job of it. You came so close to actually understanding what evolution is and how it works, but you just can't seem to get past the ideas that small changes can add up to big changes, and that evolution as a process has no overall goals. Also, I'm not sure if you noticed this yourself, but your whole video is just one big straw man. I mean, instead of trying to demonstrate why evolution is, in your opinion, false, you decided to reword the definition and then declare that evolution as you define it is impossible. Well, that's nice, but since that's not how any scientist defines it, it doesn't matter. That's it for this video. I think I might continue with the series. It, it's much more pleasant to watch than any other creationist material I've seen. Uh, remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. See you next time.